Somebody uh, turn to your neighbor and say, struggle. Turn to the neighbor on the other side, say, struggle. Say it like you had a struggle. (laughs) Paul's speaking here about a struggle, a labor. In our culture, struggling is a sign of failure. In our age, struggling is that thing that you avoid at all costs because it impedes upon your happiness. And if you find yourself in a struggle, you find yourself in a place of failure, guilt, shame, perhaps a sense of isolation and abandonment. Failure is the thing that we attempt to avoid at all times. I was speaking with an admissions rep at a conference a long time ago in Ventura, down south, who was speaking about the struggle of incoming students who didn't know how to struggle. Her wording specifically was, you've heard of helicopter parents. For those of you that might have heard of helicopter parents, that was when parents used to hover like a helicopter, right? Watching everything that we did. She said, now that's been replaced with lawnmower parents. Lawnmower parents don't hover, they mow. And as I was listening to her say this, I'm like, oh no, I've been mowing, I've mowed. I'm a mower. <laughs> Lawnmower parents mow down specifically all of their children's challenges, discomforts, and struggles. It's a sign of failure. It's something to be avoided at all costs. For her, she saw this in the dormitories. And kids, fresh out of their homes, didn't know what to do with struggles. Whether it was a difficult exam or a hard class, they wanted to give up or a conflict in a, dormitory, a, a, in a dorm room with somebody that they, they didn't know how to handle. They wanted to give up and go home. USA Today puts it this way, in raising children who have experienced minimal struggle, we are not creating a happier generation of kids. We are creating a generation that has no idea what to do when they actually encounter struggle. Of course, that's with college, but this affects the entire sphere. Work. Work doesn't give you the exact modicum of fulfillment that you were hoping it did. You just find another job. Church doesn't have the freshest flavor of coffee that you were hoping it had. You just find another church. Marriage starting to weigh down on you. Well, just find another spouse. Your goals aren't getting you exactly what you wanted with immediate results. You just give up on them and so on and so forth. In our culture, struggling is a sign of failure. Suffering, hardship, difficulty, hitting a wall is a sign of failure, something to be avoided at all costs. The Bible gives us a completely different perspective on struggles. I just want to read, because I can't put it any more shockingly than the way that the Apostle Paul says it in our first verse. Listen to this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. (laughs) I I rejoice. It it doesn't matter what generation. Every single generation for the last hundred years has uh, perhaps dealt with struggles in a different way, but none of them rejoiced. Some of us might have bitten our upper lip and just pressed on for the goal. Others might have uh, bundled up in a, a, a quiet space. Others might have blown through the wall independently. Others might have been afraid of it, but none of, I have never heard anybody in their right mind rejoice in the midst of their sufferings unless they were crazy or followers of Jesus. Sometimes the line is blurry. He's saying, I I rejoice in my sufferings. I could barely get out of bed sometimes. Paul's like, I rejoice in my sufferings. And, And make no mistake, he's not trying to figure out what he's gonna eat for lunch. This is a prison letter, one of his four prison letters. He's writing this from a dungeon. He thinks he's going to escape, perhaps, or not escape. He thinks he's going to be let, uh, let free. But history tells us that Paul would meet his death in that dungeon. He would be beheaded by, by the emperor. That's what Paul's rejoicing in the midst of. He's in a dungeon in the middle of the ground, chained to two, uh, to two guards. He's saying, I rejoice. You know what that word in the Greek means? It means Rejoice. He's rejoicing. He's got joy. 
This is silly. Why is Paul rejoicing? Now, it's not because he's morbidly enjoying his hardships. Nowhere in the Bible am I aware of. The Bible says, hey, when hardship comes your way, uh, f- uh, enjoy the bad that's happening to you. Rather, Paul seems to see something beyond the struggle that's enabling him to endure the struggle. He sees something out there. He sees a goal. He sees a purpose in it. And he's about to explain what he sees beyond that struggle in the next verse. He says in uh, the second half of verse 24, and... And that word there is a part of that, the, the part of the syntax of that sentence, it's there to clarify the sentence that came before it. So what Paul is about to say or explain is why he's able to rejoice in suffering. Here it is. In my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church. How many of you are like waiting for an easy answer and you're like, I'm still confused. This is a very difficult passage to interpret. This is Paul's reason. This is part of his reason for why he can rejoice no matter what happens to his life. But this is a very difficult passage to interpret. Scholars have a hard time with this passage. Understanding what it means. Uh, That which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ is perhaps one of the most difficult phrases to interpret in this letter. For example, look at this. Uh, scholar David Powell, who says, that which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ is perhaps one of the most difficult phrases to interpret in this letter. See? So what I want to do, if it's difficult for that guy, I want to tread lightly with this passage and start with at least two things because the entire passage seems to hinge on the end of verse 24. So we wanna, we wanna come away with some kind of idea of what Paul is saying. So here's what we're gonna do. I want us to leave with at least two points. One, what this passage cannot mean. And two, what it can mean. What we can know that it means, right? What it can't mean and what we can know that it means. And then we'll come back after that and answer the original question about what Paul sees in his struggle that is causing him to rejoice. But first, here's here's the first point. Christ's finished work is complete. This is where we have to start. In other words, here's what this passage can't mean. It can't mean that there's something lacking in Christ. It can't mean that there was something that he didn't quite uh, get or accomplish in his death on the cross and in his resurrection. It can't mean that. Christ's finished work is exactly that. It is finished. In fact, from the words of Jesus Christ himself in John 19, 30, as he's hanging on the cross, it says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And we saw for the last few weeks, all through Colossians chapter one, ways in which the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross has already accomplished benefits for people who have put their faith and trust in him. Amen? Colossians chapter one, verse 13 through 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter one, verse 20. Through him, he is reconciling to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Colossians one, verse 22. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Colossians 2, verse 13 through 14. We'll get to this in a, in a week or two. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside. How? By nailing it to the cross. And we see this decisive, conclusive finished nature of Christ's work. It's not going to be done. It was already done. He has delivered us. We have redemption. Our sins are forgiven. We are reconciled. Our sins are nailed to the cross. This has already happened. 
When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we simply tap into the resources that have already been made available by the kingdom of God. There is nothing that needs to be added to Christ's finished work. It is complete. But here's the second point. We could also say that our participation with Christ is still ongoing. Christ's finished work is complete. Our participation with him, including his death and his resurrection, is ongoing. I want to read to you a passage from 1 Peter chapter 4. This is the Apostle Peter. And listen to this, listen to this first line. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Read into fiery ordeal everything that you're going through right now. Struggle. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Isn't that wild? Today, because of our radical, individualistic, consumeristic, instant gratification, microwavable culture, we have been trained with cultural scripts to say, if you are struggling, something's wrong with you, get out, give up, stop. Peter's saying, listen, don't be surprised if you struggle because you're following Jesus. As if something strange were happening to you. Peter would meet his death on a cross too, upside down. Do not be surprised if you encounter struggle. Do not be surprised if you follow Jesus and you still encounter struggle. Do not be surprised if you follow Jesus and you encounter more struggle than you were before you were following Jesus because everything about Jesus is bunching up against the cultural scripts of this day. Do not be surprised. Listen to what he says after that. But rejoice. There's that word again. Gosh, Peter. Rejoice. Listen to this, though. In as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Participating in the sufferings of Christ. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, and he gives an example of the types of hardship and suffering, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Not only does he say to rejoice when you're participating in difficulty because you're participating in Christ's life, but then he says, you're blessed. <laughs> That's crazy. You can almost imagine like looking at the Apostle Peter's Instagram feed. Like you're going through your Instagram feed, the Apostle Peter's one of your friends, and you see all of your friends. You see uh, Lucy over there at Coral Casino, and she's leaning back bronzing, and she posts, you know, hashtag blessed. And then right after Lucy is John, and he's like, I don't know, he's got a, uh, you know, he's hanging out and playing volleyball at the beach, and it's sunny, and he's got this bronze and abs, and he's like, hashtag blessed. And then you come across your buddy, the Apostle Peter, who's about to get his head eaten off by lions in the Colosseum, and he's flashing up a hashtag blessed. You're like, that makes no sense. No, it makes no sense the way that we tend to think about blessing. What is the way that we think about blessing? Everything that I want is going to happen. No struggle, no pain, no tribulation, no hardship. Pleasure only, when I want it, how I want it. But the Bible speaks about a blessing that goes much deeper than human circumstances. It speaks about this power from on high that invades your life precisely in the moment of your struggle, that is able to sustain you through difficulties. And the apostles refer to that as blessing. It's God's world touching your world precisely in the middle of the struggle. Blessed. Blessed. Why would we be called to participate in the sufferings of Christ? Well, Jesus was speaking to his disciples in John 13, and he said, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus is saying, if you worship me, if you follow me, if you look up to me, 
Wouldn't you expect that you would do the things that I did and walk in the way that I did? And he gives an example of serving one another. And these were disciples who had dreams of upward mobility. They wanted to be kings. They wanted to rule at the right and left-hand side of Jesus. They wanted to take down Rome and be wealthy, all of that stuff. And Jesus is saying, Jesus, the most powerful figure in their life, is saying, I'm washing feet. Don't you think you ought to wash feet? I'm your master. You think you're greater than me? A few chapters later, he will apply this to suffering and persecution. He's saying, I, I went through hard things. Not everybody accepted me. Don't you think if you're my pupil, like that's gonna happen to you too? You think you're better than me? You're not better than me. If you're following me, you're following me through all the stuff. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, and this is my last example, he would make this absolutely clear so that there's no ambiguity. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know what it means to take up your cross? It doesn't mean to wear jewelry with crosses on it or to tattoo a cross on your shoulder. Although if you've got that, that's cool. Jesus is speaking a little bit more than that, though. The cross in the first century was an instrument of Roman execution meant to push down and squelch opposition, of whom Jesus was one of those. It was ghastly. It was filled and invested and imbued with horror and shame. It, by its own visual representation alone, sent waves of fear into the population. The cross, for a lot of people today, is decorative. So maybe a better example for us is if Jesus were to say, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his electric chair and follow after me. How many of you cringed at the sound of that? That's what Jesus is saying. And for the disciples, it was quite literal. Every single one of those 12 disciples died for Christ, except for John, who was merely tortured. Now, for us, most of us will probably not meet our death at some Roman emperor's hand. But the call to die is still the same. Only, it might not necessarily be physically, but it's dying to our life as we used to know it, at least. It's dying to our selfish uh, ambitions, our self-referenced way of viewing our life. It's dying to uh, our tendency to place ourselves in the middle of our own world. It's dying to that life and adopting a new life in Jesus Christ in whom our life is hidden, Colossians chapter 3. In other words, make no mistake, Jesus is saying... Following me is going to be a blessing. It's going to be full of joy like you've never understood. Rivers of living water will pour out of your heart and soul, but there will also be challenges and struggles. I want you to follow me through all of those because that's what I did. So Christ's finished work is complete. There's nothing lacking in Jesus, but then our participation with him is ongoing. It just started. We're called to follow him, not merely believe in him. So I want to go back to the original question. What does Paul see beyond his struggles that causes him to rejoice? Because if we can wrap our minds and hearts around that, we can take that kind of power into our struggles. We can be a little more sustained. If we can just understand what Paul saw, and this is what he saw. If you take both of those points, Paul sees his participation in hardship as something beyond just his mere circumstances. He sees that he is actually participating in the life of Christ. And that's benefiting him, but it's also benefiting other people. That's why he keeps saying things like, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. That is the church. In some way, Paul is seeing the way that he struggles as being a benefit for people around him. If it wasn't if it wasn't baffling enough to think of rejoicing in suffering, think of rejoicing in suffering for the benefit of those around you. How is that even possible? I want to give you two things. One, the Bible tells us that the struggle 
difficulty, hardship as a follower of Christ actually allows us to mature in our faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. It tells us that the, uh, the, the fruit of transformation doesn't always grow on the mountaintops. It grows in the valleys, in the valley of the shadow of death where we fear no evil because God is with us. It grows in the difficult places. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one through four, listen to this. The author says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, in other words, since we have so many people to look up to that have gone before us, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Sin being that shorthand word for all the ways in which we orient our lives away from God and the behavior and action that follows from that. The author of Hebrews is saying, hey, let's take away everything that is slowing us down from following Jesus Christ, including our sin. That is a struggle in and of itself. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Author of Hebrews is saying, hey, your journey following Jesus has just begun. There's joy awaiting you. But that joy awaiting you is also tied with you carrying your cross, stripping away the things that slow you down. You say, this sounds so morbid. No, it doesn't. Think of anything worthwhile in your life that you have achieved or experienced. Anything. Buff dudes in this room that have been weight training for 10 years, that was a struggle. You didn't just wake up like that eating Doritos. Saving for retirement, that involved you putting away all of those lattes and instead putting that into a fund that you never get to see for like 40 years. That's a struggle. A diet plan. I want to have abs when I'm 50, So I'm going to put away this hamburger today. Almost anything worthwhile in our life involves a struggle. That's how we mature in all sorts of ways. We're giving up short-term desires for a future goal. You're suffering now for something better later. Now what about the spiritual life? How would this apply? Well, think think of some examples. When you resist temptation now, your cravings, Instant gratification because you long for Christ's likeness over time. When you practice spiritual disciplines, but like being in the word because you want to be present to God, even though you're tired and just want to veg. When you give and pray and gather together with the church, even when you don't feel like it, these are all ways in which we put aside short-term benefits for a better future goal. And that is a part of struggling. The struggle allows us to mature in our faith when we're doing it in union with Christ. But the struggle can also be to the benefit of other people. Love itself, by definition, is a struggle. It involves suffering. It's not a feel-good emotion. Love is being committed to somebody else's highest good without any guarantee of reciprocity and sometimes even at your own expense. That is a definition of love. And that is also an overlap of suffering and struggling. Doing something for others even though you're not getting anything out of it. Paul would say to the Philippian church, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more important than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Love. There's struggle involved with real love. Now, how would this look uh, in your own life? I'll just, we all think of those huge examples. Paul giving his life for the church, praying for them from a dungeon. 
but it also affects the tiny minutia of life. It's when you endure the anger of another person and instead of giving anger back, you, you return mercy. Maybe in the form of a hug. Struggle for other people's benefit. When you give up me time after the end of a long work day, all you want to do is just watch Netflix for four hours. But instead, you call that person up and you talk to them because you know that they need you. When you listen to your spouse, even though you've had a hard day, you know they had a hard day too. And instead of snapping at them, talking about yourself the whole time, or blaming them, you listen to them, giving up what you want for somebody else's long-term good. It's when you spend time with your kids instead of working that extra hour. It's when you ask genuine questions of somebody at your home group instead of talking only about yourself. These are small examples, but you can see in them how your struggle could affect positively the other person. This is love. And Paul says to this church in Colossae, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions in me for the sake of the body. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I get to do this. I get to allow God's love to pour out of my heart from the depths of my brokenness into your life. Some of you might be saying, yeah, but all of those are examples are examples of us voluntarily choosing to struggle. What about the struggles in life that we never chose for ourselves? What about broken families and divorce, and absentee parents, crazy kids that don't listen to us? What about cancer? What about leukemia? What about the death of a loved one? What about unemployment? And the list goes on. I didn't choose those to participate with Christ. What happens when those things come? I want to ask you a a question in return. Have you ever met somebody who went through unimaginable loss and seemed to be more compassionate towards you than anybody else? I have. Have you ever... Have you ever met somebody who's been through a lot and somehow counterintuitively, they're also deeper than anybody you've ever met? I have. You ever met someone who is battling cancer and you go to pray for them, but they're the ones ministering to you? That's crazy. Of course, there's hundreds of examples of that not happening because suffering left by itself turns people bitter and resentful and hateful. Suffering by itself doesn't change you. Something else in the midst of suffering changes you. But we've all seen those examples. People who have gone through so much and yet are more compassionate, more loving, more present than people who have not yet struggled. What is that? How is that even possible? Where does the power to struggle well like that come from? And this is what I think Paul is starting to say in verse 25 through 27 when he speaks about the stewardship from God given to him to make uh, the mystery that's been hidden from the ages revealed to us. And he says, this is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. How can people with cancer who have lost loved ones, who have lost homes, who have lost jobs, who have lost all sorts of different things, still find depth in their soul to love other people well. Paul seems to say, this is the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know what? You know what the definition of Christianity is? Maybe that's too concrete. Maybe I should say, what what is the mark of Christianity? Perhaps some of you would say, well, it's going to church, or it's being a good moral person, or it's believing some things about Jesus or it's doing the right things, or it's not doing the wrong things. That might all have some truth in it, but if you look at the way that the apostles spoke and Jesus spoke, we'd have to say that the essence of Christianity is God making his home in human people. Union with God in Christ. This is what sustains people in their suffering. 
God not being on the outside, but coming on the inside of a broken, hurting person and ministering love to them from the inside out. That is what sustains you in suffering. And that is what makes you stronger precisely because of the suffering. Suffering by itself will just tear you apart. Some of you have not suffered that much yet. And some of you in this room have suffered more than dozens of people in this room combined. But it is inevitable, to quote the theologian Thanos, it is inevitable. <laughs> Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. You see that promise there? Jesus never promises to take us out of the struggle. He promises to overcome the world in the struggle. Jesus never promised to take me, a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fire, but he was there with them in the fire. God never promised to take Daniel out of the lion's den, but he was with them in the lion's den, shutting the mouth of the lions. God never promises to take you out of difficulties. For, and I say that for all of you who are wondering if I'm doing something wrong, or if God has abandoned me, or God has given up on me, or I just don't fit into this church Christianese scene because I'm, I'm going through a lot of stuff. And the fact of the matter is, sometimes God loves people so much that he will allow them to hit rock bottom so that he can minister to them deeper levels and waves of his love that they would never have understood or comprehended in times of affluence and comfort. Sometimes God allows you to go into the valley of the darkness because he loves you and he knows the only way to open up your heart just a little bit wider is for you to be a little more desperate for his presence in your life. God loves you. And don't you ever think that because you are struggling that he has abandoned you. Sometimes we just don't see his presence. But God is always active and he's always present. He just might not be doing the things that you were expecting him to do. This is a complete reversal of the fallen order. God doesn't just give people an escape route from suffering. He transforms the way that they view suffering. A complete reversal of the fallen order where he transforms people in the midst of hardship into deeper levels of love. Him we proclaim, Paul would say in verse 28, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That word mature means complete. God's purpose for you is to bring you to completion. Deeper levels of his love, deeper levels of character, deeper levels of loving union with God where you are able to more fully give and receive love both to God and to others, which happens as we are conformed to Jesus Christ. And sometimes it is through struggles that Christ forms us into his image. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. There's Paul again talking about something we desperately need to latch our minds and hearts on. We rejoice in suffering, knowing, here's the reason, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he gave us. Sometimes God allows us to go through things that we think that we cannot handle and perhaps that we cannot handle for the purpose of expanding our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can pour love abroad into them. To you who think that God has abandoned you, no, God just wants to bring you to deeper levels and waves of his love. And sometimes it's only possible when we hit the bottom. The end result for Paul is not this morbid fascination with suffering, but this love that moves beyond himself to other people. What would it be like, how would it be like for you if you were able to be transformed from self-pity to now thinking beyond your suffering to other people and saying, I wonder how I can be present for them. Look at Paul. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. His struggle has been turned inside out, a reversal of the fallen order. Paul cannot be destroyed by the things that destroy his body. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ has such an anchored root point in his soul that he even takes Roman dungeons and he figures out a way to make that make him think of other people through the lens of God's love in Christ. I want you to know how great a struggle I'm having for you. Unbelievable. If that's not crazy, look at what he says after that. And for all of those at Laodicea, for all who have not seen me face to face, for people he has never talked to before, never seen, never been with. That is what God does to people who are going through the fire. Sometimes he'll take you out of the fire. Sometimes he'll leave you in the fire for the purpose of bringing you out better than when you went in. Not just to be more healed, not just to be completed and whole, but to be an instrument of ministry and love and healing to people around you who are also suffering and struggling. I think one of the best examples of this is Joseph in Genesis. How God changes the way we see challenges by turning our labor into love. One of the best examples of this is Joseph. You remember Joseph in verse, uh, 30, uh, chapter 37 of Genesis? He was just a young buck, and he had dreams that he was going to rule his family, and he did what firstborn children often do, and he went and told all of his older brothers, I'm going to rule over you. <laughs> and they went a little over the top and sold him into slavery and almost murdered him. And years go by, and we see the sovereign hand of God using difficulties in his life to bring him to a place where he's actually second in command of all of Egypt. Right at that moment where a famine hits, and Joseph is in this place to now feed the hungry, save the world, if you will, and his family comes to him, his brothers, and they're hungry, and he sees them. And in this moment, I don't know about you, but if I were Joseph, I would have been like, all right. My brothers are coming. They're bowing at my feet. I'm going to take revenge. All y'all are going to be my butlers, all right? Joseph does something different. He says, hey, listen, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Yeah, I know you were evil. I got that. But God turned what you meant for evil for good. And I'm here because of God's plan for my life. And then he sits them at the table and breaks bread and drinks wine with them. That is transformation. What's the greater miracle here? That God turns Joseph's struggle around or that God turned Joseph around to see his struggle in a different light? True freedom is not an absence of suffering, but an empowerment in the midst of suffering. And that kind of empowerment and transformation does not happen overnight. You're not going to be transformed by walking into Monday tomorrow. Sermons don't transform people. Transformation happens by people who participate in the life of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit over the long haul. Right now, we might not be transformed. Some of you, you're like, you're not You're like, all right, Monday, I'm going to be Genesis 50 Joseph. But you're not Genesis 50 Joseph. You're you're Genesis 37 Joseph. You're still talking about your dreams and stepping on people all around you. It's not going to happen overnight. It happens when we join Christ in union with him, following the ways of Jesus, learning to do all that he taught us by the power of the Holy Spirit, because we deeply believe that it's a better life. I'm going to ask Robert and the rest of the team to come out here as we respond in worship. And what I want to do over the course of the second set of worship is, is to respond to God in three movements as we sing. Because this might be a loaded topic for some of you. Some of you are going through really gnarly stuff. And I don't want to rush this. I want to do this in three movements. So what I'm going to do right now is I want to call you to identify your pain. I'll come up after the next song and I'll, I'll move us to a place where we can then look at God and how he's moving in our pain. And as we close out the service, we'll respond in a corporate call and response prayer so that God can shape us to love others in our pain. But we're not gonna get there yet. Right now, before you can find God in your pain, we have to identify our pain and some of you are hiding from it right now. 
And before God can minister to you in your pain, in your struggle, in your situation, in that difficulty, in the brokenness, in the sadness, in the grief, we have to acknowledge that it is real and that it is there. So here's the question I leave with you as we sing together. Where are you struggling right now? Don't run anymore. This is the mystery that has overcome the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if Christ is not afraid of the struggle, he's not afraid of your struggle too. And if Christ can hold the world together by the word of his power, he can hold your life together despite the struggles. But the first order of business is to be honest with what we're going through. Identify, this is where I need help to bring it before the Lamb of God who is here now, present with you, active and waiting.